As a teenager growing up in southern Ohio, I played a board game at summer camp called Save the Whales. What were we saving the whales from? From whalers, of course, but also from the International Whaling Commission and the general attitude that whales were better as food than as something to be preserved. I wouldn't generally recommend using a board game to learn about history, but in this case, the game helped spark my interest. Why were people so angry about the International Whaling Commission? Why were people arguing about the proper use of a whale? 30 years later, I finally written this book. I have been fortunate to have access to archives in Norway, Great Britain, the United States, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada, the papers of the International Whaling Commission, as well as the papers of prominent scientists and whalers. In them, I discovered that as early as 1913, Sir Sidney Harmer of the British Museum of Natural History had warned that whaling in Antarctic waters was about to follow an unsustainable course. Harmer's was not a voice in the wilderness. Many other prominent observers of the whaling industry expressed similar concern over the next 30 years. And yet, 50 years later, it was no longer legal to hunt humpback or blue whales in the Antarctic seas because both species were nearly impossible to find. Why had these knowledgeable and powerful people been unable to put whaling on a sustainable course? Part of the answer comes from the widespread agreement that whales were masses of meat and blubber that were meant to be harvested. Technology, too, is part of the answer. Huge floating factories allowed whalers to work on the high seas, far from any governmental authority. New refining techniques converted whale oil to margarine, which meant that many Europeans encountered whales as a thin spread on their morning toast, and most governments were determined to keep the oil flowing. Efforts in the 1930s by business owners and then government officials like Henry Maurice to curtail whaling failed to make a dent in the catch. In 1946, negotiators like Birger Bergerson created a new agency, the International Whaling Commission, that they hoped would be able to use scientific knowledge to create sustainable whaling while also protecting the sovereignty of the member nations. At the same time, the American Occupation Army sent Japanese whalers back to the Antarctic waters, generating meat, foreign exchange, and acrimony for the next 70 years. Yet rogue whalers like Aristotle Onassis and anybody working for the Soviet Union made it impossible for the relatively honest whalers to accept sacrifice in the name of conservation. Only 60 years after Sir Sidney's warning did it become possible to organize large-scale opposition to whaling. Whale oil was no longer a basic commodity, and researchers using recorded whale songs began to argue that whales were sentient beings. The Save the Whales movement gathered momentum around the world, searching for persuasive and consistent arguments in favor of ending whaling, and environmentalists struggled with difficult questions, such as the protection of aboriginal rights. So 100 years after Sir Sidney's prophetic warning, most people who encounter whales can't imagine harpooning Willie. But have we learned lessons that can help us solve the ocean's problems?